there are there are companies, there are projects, there are groups of people, there are individuals who use proprietary software because they have this notion in their head that open source software is not as secure. Um, it's less secure. It's less quality. It's it's you know some people even go to, go as far as to say it's it's it's, it's a plaything. Um, so. The, that's a myth. That's that's not the case at all. So we're we're going to address a few a few myths in here, and maybe maybe through discussion afterwards we can come up with a few more. Because I feel like this is something that needs to be addressed. While I was doing research for this talk, um, I, I was coming across articles that that expressed exactly what I wanted to say. And then I looked at the timestamp on the article. Some of them were 2013, 2015. So. This, this talk is an issue that has been going on for years, and we really need to lay it to rest. So I tell you what, right here, today, Father's Day 2019, we at Southeast Linux Fest are going to lay these myths to rest, and no one's ever going to bring them up again, right? <laughs> or so we can hope. <laughs> right. Famous last words. So who am I? Um, like I said, my name's Eric, the IT guy. Uh, for my day job, I'm a solutions architect for GitLab. GitLab is a single application for the entire DevOps process. So we have issues, we have project management, we have code repositories, uh, we have um, CI, CD pipelines, we have security scanning, we have monitoring, we have, uh, uh, and by the end of the year, we'll have uh, Defend as, as well. So we'll be able to do some protections for your application live while it's running. Um, so I'm a solutions architect. I'm, I'm basically a sales engineer. Um, no relation to GitHub. Um, I'm also an open source advocate. I've worked with the GNOME Foundation. I've worked with Jupiter Broadcasting, the Ask Noah Show. Um, so some I, I know I know most everybody here by the, by now. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to to talk to everyone about uh, security myths. But one other thing I think you should know about me is I really hate shaving. Bear with me for a moment. I, I just, I hate shaving. It's repetitive, it's time consuming. Finding the right razor and the right shaving cream, it's expensive. It's, it's a pain, and it's, it's just a pain. And if you're like me, if you shave, you look like you're 12. So I, I, I had this thought while I was trying to get cleaned up and, and make myself presentable this morning. Um, it, it took some time to get, to get the girlfriend sign off before I was you know, presentable enough to come in front of you all. Um, and I, I had this thought that waterfall development is kind of a little bit like shaving. It's slow. It's prone to issues. I mean, how many of us have, have drawn blood from our own faces while we're trying to shave? It's, it's, waterfall is non-collaborative. So, so what does all that mean? Waterfall is, ha, has been the standard for, for application development for years. Why? The common answer I get when I ask around is that's what we've always done. And that's, that's a mentality that needs to be laid to rest just as much as, um, just as, much as the, the security myths that we're going to address. What that means is <clears throat> you spend a couple of months writing up a project plan. You're going to define exactly every task that you're going to have to touch, exactly how long every one of those tasks are going to take to complete. <clears throat> And after, the, after a couple of months of sitting through meetings doing that, meanwhile you're spending all of your, your non-meeting time trying to keep up the legacy garbage that's, that's falling apart. And then you spend a few months writing the application, building new databases, deploying new servers to your non-production environment. And you write all your application, you put in all your features, and then after three or four months that was only supposed to take two, because that's what your, your project plan said, then you realize, oh wait, is my stuff vulnerable? We should probably security scan this stuff. So then begrudgingly, de the dev team goes over to the security, gr to the security group and says, hey, we we've got this thing and we need it scanned like yesterday because we're over budget, we're over, we're over time, we need this scanned now. So security wedges it into their, into their schedule and uh, and, and they scan it, and you, they find dozens and dozens of vulnerabilities, some of them dating back years. A lot of them are high-severity issues that could lead to data breaches, that could lead to DOS attacks. And then you have to go back and remember the code that you wrote three months ago, which I don't know about you, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Maybe even today. Depends on the day. <laughs> So how many of us can go back and look at code we wrote three months ago and find the security vulnerability to fix it? 
Now we're even more over budget. Now we're even more over time. Management's getting angry. Operations is getting frustrated because the legacy system continues to go down every other day. You're to the point where you just, you wake up in the morning, you reboot a server. You go to lunch, you reboot a server. You get back from, you, you, you spend dinner with your family, you reboot a server just to keep that legacy environment running. Meanwhile, your customers are starting to look at competition because the features you promised them six months ago that would be ready in three are now overdue. So how many of you in the audience have gone through this nightmare? How many of you have gone through this nightmare more than once? I feel like I, I've been a systems engineer for 10 years before I came to GitLab, which, by the way, I'm not selling GitLab. I'm just relating, uh, relating feelings so your wallets are safe. But I, I've, I've been a systems engineer for 10 years. And to be honest, I got burned out on it. Because while development and security and project management are doing their thing, I'm the one who gets the call at 2 a.m. when the application goes down. I'm the one who gets called on the weekends to try and, and revive a database server that no one really cares about, but it has to be up by 8 a.m. on Monday because the two people in the company that still use that application desperately need it, even if they don't. I mean, I, I can tell by the looks on people's faces, this is not news to most of us. We've all felt this pain. So what, how do we fix this? How do we change this? Well, a number of years ago, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it, it took me about 10 minutes to put that into the, into the talk, but uh, all, all my fellow dads out there know, know that song, and it, it's, it's now going through the back of our heads as, as we're talking about security. <laughs> So a few years ago, some folks got together at a conference very similar to this, and they sat down and they said, this is stupid. Why are we doing this? Didn't we, in, didn't we come up with technology? Didn't we build computers to make our lives easier? And now we're working more hours. We're up more times than ever. Divorce rates are skyrocketing. I haven't seen my kids in a month. I don't remember what it means to work an eight-to-five job anymore because this is the world that we live in. We live in this monolithic waterfall world that doesn't do justice for anybody. The developers don't like it, the system administrators don't like it, the customers don't like it. Nobody likes it, but we still do it because that's what we've always done. So this, this philosophy of DevOps has come along. It's, it's, it ties into agile, it ties into safe, it ties into some of these, some of these develop methodologies, but it's gotten a bad rap. Because I, the last company I worked at, my boss said that DevOps was just a hippie notion of a bunch of people sitting around a campfire daydreaming. It's like, okay, well, um, <laughs> way to take something that people have been working on and studying and iterating on for years and then just throw it away. Gr really forward thinking. So DevOps may have this, this notion of being shiny, but let me tell you, it really changes the course of your, of your business when you adopt some of these principles. And that's what they are. DevOps is a philosophy. It's not a tool. It's not an application that you can install. It's not, it's not a program that you go through and get certified. It's a, think, it's a way of thinking. It's a philosophy. DevOps is a way of doing business. In fact, to tie things back into why we're here, DevOps wouldn't exist without the open source community, be that FOSS or just straight OSS. Let's, let's make an equivalency real quick. I'm not talking about dollar value. I'm just talking about source code. So open source software, free and open source software. I'm talking about both right now. DevOps created a community within, within enterprise IT to change the way that we do work. Now instead of spending months building a project plan that within the first week is already overdue, we take one issue at a time, we take one feature at a time, and we iterate on that. We put something down on paper, basically. Get something onto a server that people can look at, can play with, and tweak. And then you take issues, you, you create issues, you make pull requests, you add new features, you, you scan these applications as you're developing them so that it's secure from the start, so that it's open source from the start, so that it works from the start, and then you add to it from there. So this sounds great. We're, we're giving up waterfall. We're, we're, we're done with the monolith. We're going to break our application down into smaller, more manageable pieces. We're going to break those applications down into smaller processes. Those processes we can make changes to. 
We can take one issue at a time, work it till it's done, and move on to the next. So this sounds great. It's been working. Companies out there are iterating faster and faster and faster. I mean, Netflix went from a DVD rental service to an open source, just a monster in this industry. And I, I, don't, I don't mean monster in a negative uh, sense. They are huge in this space, and they're open sourcing more and more of their tools all the time. So if this makes so much sense, if this is such a good idea, why are we still having this conversation? There are still people out there that don't think that open source is secure enough for their business. And it turns out that the reasons that they're using can be quantified, and they can, they can be analyzed and pretty much disproven. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Let's look at a few, and we'll go from there. And like I said, today we're going to squash these issues. So the first issue that I, I hear, and this came up time and time again in my research, this came up time and time again in the people that I talked to about why, why is open source only 20% of what you're doing? Why is it only 30 or 40%? Why is it not 100% of what you're doing? One of the common responses I got was, I can't make sense of the licenses. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I can't imagine why. I mean, if you just go to opensource.com, they have a list of a bunch of them. And on, off the main page, they've got BSD2, BSD3, Apache2, Ap Apple Public, Eclipse1, Eclipse2, AGPL3, GPL2, GPL3, IBM, MIT, OSL3, SSPL, and Zope. Oh my. I mean, how could... How can anyone not make sense of any of that, right? <laughs> okay, so from that research, I was like, okay, yeah, I can, I can understand. That's a lot. So what do you have to do in order to make sense of everything? First, if you're, if you're going to use open source licensing, you kind of have to break it down into two categories. There's copyleft and permissive. So copyleft, if, if I, I found this quote, and I had to use it. It's, it's cited in my, in my notes. But uh, if the source is open, so must your code be. Apparently, Yoda is now a, uh, a developer. So what that means is if the project that you're using has an open source copyleft uh, license, then you need to follow suit. You have to license yours the same way, and you have to give credit back. If it's a permissive license, on the other hand, anything goes. You have the right to use it, modify it, redistribute it, you don't necessarily have to give credit back, but because this is an open source community, it's kind of encouraged. In fact, you're seeing more and more companies and more and more projects and communities get ounced because they are not following the intention behind, behind the licensing. So we're seeing more and more fracturing within our community. So I found some resources. And, and just, just a heads up, I'm talking about open source and security. This talk itself is open source. At the end of the slide, I, or at the end of the slide deck, I've got a link to the talk where you can download it, use it, give it somewhere else, give me feedback back. I, I'm, this, this talk, just as, much as, just as much as the content, the talk is open source. So I've got some resources listed out. Things like going to opensource.org slash licenses. There's a book published by O'Reilly called Understanding Open Source and Free Software Licensing. Um, there's always our, our friend uh, Google or DuckDuckGo search engine of your choice. Um, in fact, if this is important enough to your business and you're getting enough pushback from your, from your leadership, there are actually attorneys that specialize in open source licensing. And you can find them through a lot of the foundations that, uh, the, that we work with. Um, the Free Software Foundation has a booth, and I'm sure that, that the, uh, the FSF can help you find an attorney who can help you talk through that. So everybody loves licensing. But with that being said, I'll, I'll leave that for, for your particular use cases, your particular companies to kind of figure out what, what's the best license, what type of applications can you use. But we're going to move on to the next, uh, to the next open source myth. It's developed by amateurs. Open source software is all just a bunch of kids playing around on their computers on the weekend when most kids are outside playing. That's kind of the mentality that people think of when they look at an open source project. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, there is some of that, but for the most part, I know a lot of open source developers. I know, I've worked with a lot of projects in this community. 
And what you find is not a bunch of amateurs sitting in their basement at the age of 40 developing code on the weekends while they go deliver pizzas during the week. No, it is the exact opposite. The open source community is full of passionate, brilliant people. And why do they do what they do? Open source doesn't mean you get paid. Open source is typically free. So why do they do what they do? They have an itch to scratch. There's something that they're interested in learning. There's something they're, they're interested in doing. And that usually leads to a passion project. There's something, there's a need out there. There's a, there's a niche that needs to be filled. There's, there's a, a gap in our, in our technology stack. And there's someone out there that, that hits really close to home to, the, to them and to their skill set. And they become very, very passionate to the point where they, they start up Patreon accounts to ask for donations so they can spend more time on this project. That, to me, doesn't sound like somebody who's just sitting in their parents' basement. Another one I, let, I hear, <laughs> OSS can't scale. FOSS and OSS doesn't scale. It works great if, if you, you know, you're, you're running some podcasting group. It works great if, if you've got five or ten people. <laughs> I, I've got a few, a few companies on my list here that might disagree. You might have heard of them. Uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook. People like this might disagree. Got a couple of others you might recognize. WordPress. WordPress is, I think, 70-ish percent of, of all web hosting right now. They're open source. Another one you might have heard of is Netflix. If you go to netflix.github.io, you can find a lot of their tools, and they're open sourcing more and more of their tool stack every single day. So for those of us in the security space, you might have heard of Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey is a really cool application. Chaos Monkey runs rampant on Netflix's infrastructure. So if you, if you haven't heard of Chaos Monkey, I highly recommend checking it out. Basically, it runs around and within defined parameters causes chaos within your production network. Not non-production, not development, not your pre-production environment. Uh-uh. Production. It goes and it shuts down entire virtual machines. It will kill processes at random. It really develops chaos. And it's not just designed to, it's not designed for job security for the systems administrators, although it sounds like it could work that way too. But, uh, <laughs> but instead, it's, um, it is designed to help you learn and develop more robust infrastructure. Chaos Monkey is designed to help make sure that your environment can withstand random failures. Because it's not a question of when that disk is going to fail. It's not a question of when that application is going to run out of memory. It's a question of, or it's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It will happen. You have to plan for these things. And a tool like Chaos Monkey will help you do that. Every time you go out and binge watch um, the Orville on, on Netflix, you can actually, I'm not sure if Orville's on Netflix, but next, next time you go in and binge watch whatever you want to watch on Netflix, um, Next time you go out and binge watch your favorite show on Netflix, just think of what it takes to store that media, stream that media out to you, and then multiply that by, what, 10 million or however many subscribers Netflix has right now. And you'll have an idea of how vast their infrastructure is. And then multiply that onto a global scale. And then think about how dangerous it would be if their database cluster went down. They have to plan for these kinds of things. And a tool like Chaos Monkey helps do that. Why do I belabor this point? because that tool's open source. You can go and use it today. So you can't sit there and tell me that FOSS doesn't scale. The next, the, next, uh, the next myth is there's no support. This application is out there, just lives in, it just lives in the ether, and, and you know, what, you, what you see is what you get. The, the outdated documentation, the, the, uh, the, the, the tutorials that don't ever give you the output that you expect, that's, that's what you get. Uh, to an extent, I can see how this might be true. A lot, of, a lot of businesses, well, let's be real. A lot of companies are just looking for someone to blame. They want to be able to pick up the phone and know that there's a number that they can call and there's someone on the other end of that phone that they can basically chew out for their problem. <laughs> now, that's really what's going on in, in the business world. We call that an SLA. Right, exactly. We, 
Right. We've we've all used that. We've we've all needed to know that. On a serious note, we all need to know that if if an issue comes up and we can't solve it ourselves, we need to know that there's someone we can reach out to, someone that we can open a ticket and send logs to, and actually um, and actually get a <laughs> and actually get a response. <laughs> Um, but again, I would argue that that's not entirely true. This one's harder to dispute because that's true. Open source software is kind of what you see is what you get. But it's a community effort. And that's something that we've forgotten when we go. It's something that we love and celebrate on the weekends when we're running on our Linux desktops. It's something that we, we love to talk about until 2 in the morning um, when we're at a conference like this. But it, for some reason, when we get back to our businesses on the, on, on the following week, and we get back into that enterprise mindset, this is something we forget. Open source is still a community. It doesn't matter if, it, it doesn't matter if, if, if you're using it for personal use or business use. It's a community. The more that we can work together, the more that we can work through these bugs, the more that we can, we can address these issues as a community, the better the software we're going to get, which means the better the products that our businesses are going to be able to use when we go to use, our, use open source to build our, our projects. So where, where, where can we go to, to negate this particular myth? There's telegram groups, there's IRCs, there's forums, there's issue boards. If you, have an, if you come across a bug and you get an error message, for the love of Pete, please go create an issue. Developers of these open source projects can't fix an issue that they don't know is there. And there's no way for these open source projects to be able to test for every conceivable use case. There's absolutely no way. <clears throat> In fact, because we're here, there's even a show that you can call once a week and get help. It's called the Ask Noah Show. He's over at the booth. You can get his phone number and call on Tuesday nights. You can't tell me that you cannot find support. And it's not just Noah that you, can, you get support from. It is amazing to be around this community and see it at work. I have seen enterprise-level issues be addressed on the show and then not be able to be resolved on the show, but to have a, a subgroup in Telegram form spontaneously after the show and engineers get together and talk about this enterprise issue and work it to resolution. You cannot tell me that there is not support available for open source. Let's, let's, take, a, let's take a step back. Let's, let's look at, 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 I've been kind of talking in the abstract. So let's, 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 put the wheels, let's put the wheels on the road for a second. How many of us remember Heartbleed? How many of us lost a lot of sleep while trying to fix Heartbleed? So, so for those of us that don't know, Heartbleed was disclosed in 2014. Before I get into that, let me back up a second. Heartbleed affected secure web traffic across the internet in 2014. Because basically, the OpenSSL library provides, in, uh, provides the ability to encrypt traffic between a client and a server. And while that, connection, while that secure tunnel is open, and it's great to think about it in terms of a tunnel, because, it makes, because if that tunnel's not being used, it's going to get shut down. So the client, as long as, as long as you've got that tab open on your, on your browser, that client is sending a heartbeat, a, a keep alive packet, back to the server. It basically says, hi, I'm still here, and I'm sending you an encrypted payload of 40 bytes. Please send that back to me. The server receives the packet and says, okay, hi, I see you're still here. Here's your 40 bytes of encrypted data back. They, they, they do the check. If it checks out, great. If there's no response, the tunnel's closed and terminated. So what, what Heartbleed would do is it would say, hey, I'm sending you 40 bytes. Please send me 40 bytes back. But what, it, what Heartbleed would do instead is, please send me, I'm sending you 40 bytes. Please send me 120 bytes back. Now, that doesn't sound too dangerous in and of itself. But think about this. You've got all these heartbeat checks going from client to servers. So if you've got 20 people, you've got 20 of those every some odd seconds. But what you also have is you have usernames, passwords, social security numbers, email addresses, home addresses. You've got all kinds of information. So scale that up. Say, hey, I'm still here. Send me 20 bytes of encrypted data. Or here's my 20 bytes of encrypted data. Send me 200 bytes of encrypted data back. And you, you can scour through that and find all this personally identifiable information. Now, that's a, a big issue. 
You know what it came down to? There was, there was some poor coding, shall we say, in the OpenSSL library where there was not a check to ensure that the amount of data sent was the amount of data requested. All it was was basically an if-then statement that was missing. Now, you would think that OpenSSL, being as critical of a library as it is, could have been able to check that. But OpenSSL is responsible for virtually all of the encrypted traffic on the web. But they only have a $1 million budget and 11 full-time developers. That is a huge undertaking for, what, two pieces? So to ask those 11 people to be able to foresee every possible vulnerability doesn't make sense. You know what saved a lot of people's data when, when the Heartbleed scare came up? The fact that the library was open source. People in the community were able to figure out what was going on, take the information they were seeing on the internet, go through the code, and find that there was just this definition, it was just this line of code that defined the variable, and instead was able to create just a simple if-then statement. So, is open source software really more secure? In theory, on paper, yes, definitely. Because look at Heartbleed. If those 11 people were the only people that had access to that code, it may have taken a whole lot longer and a whole lot more people's lives could have been turned upside down because of Heartbleed. But it was open source. So instead of 11 people, you had 1,100 people, whatever the number may be. You had a whole lot more eyes on that code than you would have if it was proprietary. Now, if all of our libraries, if all of our applications, if all of our tools, if all of our operating systems were proprietary, you are hoping the, the team that is developing that particular library or that particular tool has the time and the knowledge and the depth of experience to foresee every single possible outcome. I, I don't see that happening. I, I, look, at, I look at GitLab, um, and I, I, I use this not because I work there and because I'm trying to sell you anything. I'm using this example because it's something I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, we have 600 people plus now in the, that work for GitLab. Only about a third of those work in product engineering. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. There's, for every, for every engineer, there's a salesman, there's, a, there's someone who works for HR, there's someone who works as a manager. So product engineering is a very small piece of that. GitLab would not be where it is today if, the, if it weren't for the fact that GitLab was open core. So while we may only have 200 some odd engineers or, and developers working on the application itself, we have over 2,000 people that have contributed code, features, bugs, issue requests, documentation, tutorials to our product to help make it better. 200 versus 2,000. And I'm sure all of our applications, I'm sure all of us can see something similar in, in the world in which we work. The other question you have to ask yourself is, What's the cost if this goes down? Do I, do I want my company's livelihood to be dependent upon my 20 or 30 so developers? Or do I want that tool to be open source and be able to get people's, people's opinions and ideas from all over the globe, from all walks of life, people that are Python developers, Go developers, um, people that have worked on iOS, people that have worked with Android, people that have worked on Windows, people that work on Linux. All of, those different, all of those different backgrounds can contribute to what we're doing. So do you, want, do you want the financial livelihood of your company to be dependent upon your team whose resources are limited, or do you want to give it out to, uh, or do you want to give it out to, to the community who can help, not because you're paying them, but because they are passionate about your product? So, we talked a lot about DevOps, we talked a lot about open source, we talked about some security, we talked about an actual, we talked about a couple of case studies. So here's, here's, my, here's my request. We're in a, we're in an open source conference. We're, we're talking about our love for Linux, we're talking about um, tools and we're, we're sharing ideas. So here's mine. As someone who's worked in the open source community and has talked to developers and talked to just how much they're trying to accomplish and how overwhelming the list of notifications and pull requests and everything can be for their, for their software, we need, more. we need more folks to contribute back. And you know, where, you know where we need the most help right now? It's in security. 
So let me let me take a quick poll of the room. I should have done this to start, but how many how many systems engineers do I have? Awesome, uh, developers. A few of you. Hopefully, you didn't feel like I picked on you too much. Network engineers. Okay, good, because it's always their fault when the network goes down. Um, any, anybody in security? A few of you. Potentially. Okay. Um, I'm a just enthusiast. Okay. Um, so here's here's something to think about. Open source is included in 90 plus percent of all applications that are out there right now. 90 plus percent has an open source component, whether that's a library, whether that's a tool, whether that's a, a monitoring API, some component of just about 90 plus percent of all applications are open source. But I, I wish, I, I couldn't find a number for this. But based on based on traffic of, of emails and 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 reports from from breaches, you know how many vulnerabilities are in every single every single one of those open source libraries? The the number would be would be breathtaking. It would be unbelievable just how far we need to go. So for my security engineers in the room, we need your help. Find an application that you use, something that's open source. Talk to, the, talk, to the, talk to the release coordinator, talk to the developers. See how you can use your expertise to help make our open source projects better. Because the more secure we are, the better, the better, the better and stronger of a community will be. Awesome. Um, there, there are tools out there that give free licenses for open source projects. GitLab's one of them. We've just started doing, um, we've just started doing security scanning as part of our CI CD pipeline. Um, I think Sonar Cube. Um, I think it's Sonar Cube has has free licensing if if you're if you're registered as an open source project. A lot of these tools out there understand the value of the of the the foundation, the open source foundation that they're built off of. So find a project, run some security scans on it, come up with some good valid reasons why that why that's an issue, and some suggested fixes. Let's make our products more secure. So just as just as an aside, um, <laughs> I, I I like to practice what I preach. Um, so a lot of a lot of the tools that I'm using at home are are going to be open sourced. Um, in fact, this entire presentation is open source. I I built it on open source tools, and uh, the talk itself is actually available online, along with some of the some of the reports that I read, along with some of the blogs that I read. Um, so I, I I invite you go grab this talk. Use it at your companies. Give me some feedback. Submit issues to uh, to make changes, or if there's tools that I didn't think of, or if there's anecdotes, case studies that that should be addressed. Um, please give back to this talk. So I, I threw a lot of information out there, a lot of abstract, but the the kind of the final thought to take away is security is always going to be an issue. There's always going to be new ways to compromise software. And people are starting to understand the value of their data. They're starting to want to move away from ad companies that just give them services for free just to sell their data for other uses. People are starting to understand that their, their data is important. And we need to do our job as IT professionals and as open source contributors to make our software more secure. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time and attention. And I, we've got about 10, 15 minutes or so. I, I would welcome any questions, any feedback, conversation. Yes, sir. So, so the comment was that um, one, one of the gentlemen in the audience, and, and this is mostly for the benefit of, of, of the stream and the recording, but one of the gentlemen in the audience is, um, is a pen tester. And he said that 
that Linux and open source stacks are usually the most secure. If he finds an up-to-date Linux box, he'll go somewhere else and, and see if he can get in other ways, unless it's WordPress. Um, but you're right. Proprietary software does have some vulnerabilities. Linux as a whole, Linux, if you follow best practice, does have some, some very deep-rooted security principles within it and is only getting better. But if you give everyone the root password and set the root password to the same thing across your entire enterprise, that's a problem. But if you follow best practice, Linux is inherently a secure operating system. And that's why we need to focus on where we're weak. Things like WordPress, plugins, things that we wouldn't always think about would be a security vulnerability. WordPress in and of itself, pretty secure. One of, and I, I say that lightly, <laughs> Where, where WordPress starts to fall short is the plugin infrastructure. And that's because most of those plugins are developed by community members. And that's not to dog on community contr contributions, not at all. But the problem is we don't always think that a plugin is going to be vulnerable. In fact, that's usually where things are the most vulnerable. So that's what we need to focus on. Our operating system itself is inherently secure. So we need to focus on where we're weak, and that's in the application stack. That's looking at these open source projects and improving the security on them. And, and in fact, in a lot of cases, like with the Heartbleed situation, the fix may be very, very simple. You go from just setting a value to actually running a check against the value before you set it. I mean, it was, I think it was like six lines of code instead of one, and, 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 and that fixed Heartbleed. So any other questions, comments, feedback? Yes, sir. So the, the comment in the room was that, uh, that hardware used, or, uh, security used to be baked into every level, starting with the hardware. And, and I would agree very, very wholeheartedly. Because if you think about, if you think about how security has been treated in, in the software development lifecycle, where is it usually? It's usually at the end. So I would say that security needs to be pushed back up the, up the hardware stack. It needs to be packed. It needs to be pushed back up towards the front of every project, and that's something that DevOps and open source are trying to accomplish. Because if you're considering security from the start, if you have if you have an environment that's completely locked down, and that's why Docker containers have have uh, have have grown so quickly, because they're inherently self-contained. There's no way out. You're stuck inside this container. Thus the name. Where the security becomes a problem is when you start punching holes in that container. So you don't need to punch more holes than you're actually going to use. You're not going to open up a whole bunch of ports, especially common ports, if you're not actually going to use those ports. So we need to go back to a mentality where security is at the table from the beginning. And that's what, that's what this whole shift left movement is about. Instead of, instead of security being at the end of your pipeline, it needs to be at the beginning. Security engineers need to be at the table. Operations engineers need to be at the table. The business, the, the leadership, the developers, they all need to be at the table at the beginning to discuss this. And instead of spending two months talking about what we're going to do, we need to actually start building these applications sooner and running security checks after every commit.
I just talk a lot. Right, very true. The, the problem is a lot of our environments today have a great engineer, and they sit over there. They have a great security guy, and they're down the hall in their own room. And there's a great developer, and he sits at a, at a building across campus. And they never talk. That, so you, you mentioned DevOps. Right, you mentioned DevOps. And if, if, if you're working with a DevOps team who then comes to you after the project's done and asks you to scan, they're not doing it right. I'll go on record and say that. It's harsh, but it's true. That's not the intention behind DevOps, and that's why, that's, that's why I had this, the shiny slide. It's because people look at it and go, oh, that's cute. I'm just going to go back to doing the work the way I was. You have to have everyone in the room at the same time. And that's why it's so important to have security at the table. That's why it's important to shift, to shift that process left. Um, so if, if you haven't read uh, something like the DevOps Handbook or um, a much shorter read and more interesting is a, a book called The Phoenix Project. And that kind of talks about what DevOps is. I, I see a few people nodding their heads. Um, in fact, for, for myself, as a systems engineer, we used to fight this battle all the time and wonder why, never, why ev not, nothing ever got done and why it was me getting called on the weekends. I was recommended this book by a couple of people. And as I was listening to this book, I was like, we just had the same conversation yesterday. Well, now I understand why that server keeps going down because the project that's supposed to replace it is a year behind. So by moving, by moving to more agile approach, we can have faster, more secure, and in the end, more featureful products that the customers can love and use sooner. So I, I, I completely agree, and, and, I, and I appreciate the feedback. Yes, sir. So, so we can we can take this conversation. Uh, we can we can uh, reconvene up, up front if we want. But uh, I do want to let everyone else get a, get a chance. If if there's any other questions, comments, yes, sir. Uh, so, GitLab bought a company called Gymnasium. Um, Gymnasium is now incorporated into the product itself. Um, they basically became the start of the security team. There's um, there's a couple of other scanning tools, and I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but uh, GitLab, uh, out of the box, will offer SAST and DAS scanning. So that's static application scanning and dynamic application scanning, um, and they do exactly what they sound like. They scan your application at the code level and then while it's actually running. Um, it does container scanning if you're, if you're integrating with Docker. 
Um, so it'll run checks for, for Docker, um, specific vulnerabilities. There's license scanning um, that, uh, that does, uh, that checks to make sure that you don't have any blacklisted um, licenses in your, in your application code. So you can, you can actually set a list. You can define a list of, I don't want to use Apache, or I don't want to use Apple, or whatever the case may be. You can actually list those out, and it'll do a license scan to verify that all of your code is compliant with, with what you've set forth. Um, and then by the end of the year, we're going to have IAST. So that's, that's interactive application scanning. Um, and basically, that's going to try and send random uh, inputs back to your application. So it'll try to address things like stack overflows, like SQL injections, um, things like that, to try and, and, and basically force its way to log into your application. Um, so I don't remember the names of the spe specific tools, and pretty much all those tools are open source, um, but they are, they are kind of, in, they are integrated into the, the application itself, in, into GitLab itself. Um, not yet. Right now, they are part of the ultimate tier, um, but uh, I've, I've heard murmurings that uh, that's going to be moving down into potentially the core just because of this specific problem. Because, we ha because so much of our infrastructure, and I, I don't mean at the enterprise level, I mean so much of our world is dependent upon these open source projects, and they're just not as secure as they need to be. I mean, you, you look at some of the attacks that have been leveraged against power plants and government entities. Um, I mean, an entire city was taken down because of, because of a hack. And a lot of that may have been caused by open source vulnerabilities. So because of that, GitLab is seriously considering moving their security tools into the core edition just to try and resolve some of these issues. Um, any other questions? Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your attention and the feedback. Um, it'll, uh, it'll help me move forward.